I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's 5.02. So um, I'm, I'm here to welcome you to what I think is going to be an absolutely wonderful panel about praxis in the pandemic, which, you know, it's like how to teach art and photography and language um, and media studies and science. How do you do that from your living room? These are, I think this is one of the top questions that's on people's minds right now. Like, they just assume, and I think there's a lot of assumptions in general about what online education can be or what, what we're calling remote education can be. Um, and I think we're, we're at Pitzer, we're trying to push all those boundaries. Um, and we're doing that through the creative thinking of our faculty, which is what these panels are about. So I'm really eager to be part of this conversation tonight for my own edification, to learn about the amazing work and conceptions of my colleagues um, tonight, the panel is going to be led by Ruti Talmor, who is a professor of media studies here at Pitzer College and in the intercollegiate uh, department, uh, or the Department of Intercollegiate Media Studies. I think I just butchered that as well. Um, but anyway, Ruti's going to be introducing and leading the panel. Um, and then I'm, I'm inviting Ruti also to be a panelist. So she's not only going to be, you know, passing off and commenting, but she also will be presenting. Um, as one of the panelists herself, which is a little bit different, but it's important. Uh, just a couple of, of pieces of business. This is all part of, uh, you know, an attempt on the part of the faculty, I think, to share information with our students. And we're so um, eager to, to share what our thinking has become over these last few months. We were all in a pretty much state of emergency in the spring. Um, and we got through the semester. Some of us, you know, had wonderful experiences in the classroom, even in the spring. Um, but I think every one of us has given our classes in the fall um, a, a lot of thought and a lot of creative energy. So I, um, this is the third in a series of panels. Um, I'll put into the chat um, the, the, the links on the link on Facebook where you can view the last, uh, the, the two previous panels. We also had a week full of office hours between uh, faculty and students, and they were really successful. There was just steady streams of students coming into those. I think Ruti just got out of one, and Tim, you did one this morning, I think, right? This afternoon, afternoon, yeah. Um, yeah so we were... they've just been taking place, and you can feel free to comment on anything that happened in those. Um, uh, just housekeeping stuff um, is freely use the chat. Uh, to chat about stuff. If you have, it moves pretty fast depending on how many people are here. And um, if you have questions you want answered, because it's a webinar format, you have to put them, you can put them into the chat, but it's a little easier if you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Ruti Talmor. Hi everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, practically speaking, the way we're gonna do it is each of, we'll go in alphabetical order. I'll introduce the individual speakers. Everyone will speak for five to seven minutes. And then after that, we'll open it up for Q and A, which Susan Phillips and I will be moderating for the speakers. My name is Ruti Talmor. I'm the professor of media studies here on the panel. And I'm also the current chair of the intercollegiate media studies program. And um, I'm excited to hear what the rest of the panelists here have to say. I know that I've personally been thinking a lot about praxis and production. I happen to be teaching my two very production heavy classes this semester. And I don't know, I'm just excited about the importance of making and community building that these classes produce in this current moment as we're all spatially isolated from each other. I think this particular group is really interesting because we have artists, scientists, language, community people, media people. It's just going to be a really interesting mixed bag of different ways that we can make our way through this. Get it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Bad joke. The first, um, our first speaker is Juanita Rista Sabal, who is in the Modern Languages Department, and I will time you in wave of five for you when you're approaching five minutes. Okay, thank you Ruti and thank you Susan for organizing this. It's great to be here and to have the chance to share with you a little bit like you know what our plans are for the fall. 
As Ruthie just said, my name is Juanita Aristizabal. I am a scholar of Latin American literature and culture. I am originally from Bogota, Colombia, and at Pitzer, I teach uh, courses in Spanish and also in Portuguese. So before I tell you about all the exciting plans that we have for the fall, I'll tell you a little bit about our programs. Uh, you may or may not know, but at Pitzer, we, in addition to a really big and great and awesome Spanish program, we also have a Portuguese program and a French program. We focus on Latin America, and that means that our Portuguese program allows our students to look at Brazil. And our French program more recently incorporated the French uh, speaking Caribbean and Creole speaking Caribbeans to, the, to our curriculum. So our approach to language teaching and learning at Pitzer in all three languages is community based. And what does that mean? That means that everything we do, all our courses, our curriculum, the way we think about teaching and learning is rooted in real connections with people and with speakers uh, across Latin America and also here in the US. So when thinking about the fall, it has been a really interesting exercise for us to think about how our courses will look like in this remote uh, learning context. And actually what has been happening is that we have been, we have seen ourselves going back to what our, our philosophy is, which is like, you know, really based on community engagement. So we're doing a lot of things that we had already been doing, but we're obviously emphasizing our global connections this fall. And we're taking everything to a whole new level. And that is something that is really exciting for us. And we actually think that the kinds of initiatives that we're taking this semester are going to have an impact in the future once this, all of this is over. So we're excited about that. So how are we going to create those global connections for our, all our Spanish, uh, Portuguese and French courses? We have a wonderful network of uh, scholars, activists, students through our wonderful study abroad programs in Ecuador, in Brazil and in Costa Rica. So we're working really hard with our partners there. And while this semester, a student, sadly, we won't be able to send our students abroad, students are gonna have the opportunity to have a little bit of a taste of what an abroad experience in these, in these three sites could be like through our courses. So every single language and culture course at Pitzer this fall is going to have different kinds of interactions with this network uh, that I was mentioning abroad through our uh, study abroad partners. So something that we had been doing in Portuguese, for instance, um, I don't know, you may know, you may or may not know, know this, but um, the Spanish program at Pitzer has a beautiful community-based program that for over 20 years has worked with local Latinx families um, to host students throughout the semester. So obviously we won't be doing that this semester. And when we were creating a community-based uh, component for our Portuguese program, we started thinking creatively to see how we could bring that community-based approach to Portuguese and we created virtual communities of, with Portuguese speakers in Brazil. So we're extending that approach and that model to Spanish this semester and students will be able to interact with Ecuadorian students throughout the semester. Uh, our French professor is also working hard to find uh, connections and to build a community, a virtual community with uh, students in Guadeloupe in the French speaking Caribbean. And these conversations that are built into our curriculum will be opportunities for students to interact with, uh, with uh, people in these countries to discuss their everyday lives or to discuss how the pandemic is affecting their communities, how, as you know, Latin America is one of the hardest hit regions uh, right now in the world um, with, uh, with the pandemic. So that's an example. And my students in my, in my a journalism uh, seminar on journalism in Latin America that I teach are going to learn about journalism in Latin America through a dialogue and interactions with local journalists that are working on the ground in Latin America. We're also going to be working with correspondents for Latin America media outlets in Europe and in Africa. So we're going to have those kinds of connections in class. And in addition to that, we're going to work with, um, we're going to work with local grassroots organizations to create podcasts to explore how they are dealing with like this need of creating community outreach and community building during a crucial semester, right? The election is happening, the pandemic is happening, 
a lot of uh, the Spanish speaking communities in the US are being really hard hit by the pandemic and they're trying to reimagine how organizing looks like in a virtual setting. So our students will be part of those conversations and to us that's really mean meaningful and it will be very exciting. And when I said that these are all things that we were already doing, I think also about a course that we have uh, on uh, the child childhood and immigration. So for that, that course has always had a community component in partnership with a local public school. And this semester, in addition to that, that connection with the local public school that will only be virtual, of course, because of the, the current situation, we're going to have a partnership with a bilingual indigenous Quechua Spanish school in Quito. So our, that is going to kind of like uh, become another dimension of that course that we're really excited about. So as I said at the beginning, like these were all things that we were already doing. We're taking, into a, taking them to a different level. We're really excited about them. And we hope that you join us. And it's an, definitely an exciting time to study culture and to study language at Pizza right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Tim Berg. Hi everyone, um, I'm Tim Berg. I teach in the studio art uh, program here at Pitzer. Um, I normally teach ceramics uh, and this semester is gonna be quite a bit different than usual, at least for me. Um, I do think in talking to my colleagues in the art field group, uh, I've been really impressed uh, how they've demonstrated their creativity and ways of adapting and being flexible in the moment. Uh, and I think artists are kind of built for this. Like we're trained to be problem solvers and the greater the limitations you put on us, the more we're able to innovate. Uh, and so I think we've all come up with uh, disparate solutions to teaching um, what our hands-on courses um, in a virtual way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I've devised and then I'll talk a little bit about my colleagues. My colleague Tara Cranach is here from photography, so she'll talk about her own plans. Um, we have uh, normally sculpture, ceramics, photography, and painting and drawing at Pitzer. Uh, and then in the senior year, students move on to a capstone two-course project um, based um, courses, the first one being more of a seminar style and the second one leading to a final thesis exhibition in our galleries, in our campus galleries. Um, so for my course this semester, I was going to be teaching beginning ceramic sculpture, which is quite a hard thing to envision online. And rather than trying to adapt that to an online reality, what I did um, was I had attended a, a workshop at the Hive, which is our human centered design program at the five C's. And one of the, the exercises in this workshop was to conceive of a course with no limitations, no physical or financial or spatial limitations. And so uh, when we were working on brainstorming uh, in that exercise, we thought we would take the students, travel through time, and go to important artist studios all over the world throughout time and human history. And I kind of took that idea and ran with it. Uh, now that we have Zoom as our format, it seemed like a, a really great way to take advantage of Zoom. And so I've been developing a class with Professor Davis at Scripps and we're planning on zooming to a different artist studio around the world each week. And students will read um, books and essays contextualizing those artists' work before we visit them. Uh, and they will give us presentations about their practice and show us around their studio and talk about works in progress and their kind of conceptual and material problem solving from start to finish. Uh, and then students will, based on that experience in the studio with the artist, they'll be kind of doing low stakes, um, hopefully really risk heavy, small exercises um, developed out of that visit. 
and twice during the semester they'll take some of those exercises and develop them into more ambitious projects and the thinking is they'll just use materials um, and tools that they have readily available to them um, and explore those things uh, in in these exercises so i'm i'm really excited about this class because honestly i have no idea how it's going to turn out uh, and to me those are the most exciting opportunities that we have as teachers um, is to try something entirely new and take some chances and see where it goes and hopefully we can adapt on the fly in the course of the uh, semester if, if, if things you know get unwieldy or we have to adapt in some way. Um, I wanted to talk about a few other classes that are being offered in art this semester. Um, Professor McCoy paint, uh, teaches painting and drawing and she'll be teaching a painting class and I think this will be a really unique opportunity because she's going to be working from home in her home studio so she'll be at home working on her paintings uh, the students will be at home uh, i guess or wherever they are working uh, on their paintings and it'll be uh, i think a really nice way of seeing her work um, really uh, in the moment um, and her she will be able to um, demonstrate things that are hands-on that she would normally demonstrate in person, but uh, I think the demonstrations will be fairly similar to what they usually are. She's also teaching a new um, class with a Pomona professor from the literature department called Ovidian Figures. Um, in that class, they'll be reading uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses uh, and working, as she said, with a lot of ekphrasis, which I had to look up. Um, and is a literary description of a visual work of art. Um, there's going to be a huge variety of interactions in that class. There's going to be drawing exercises, discussion, slide lectures, student writing, critiques. Um, they're going to be doing a, a pop-up at the Hive at the beginning of the course, which I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but the Hive is always very supportive of the arts, so I'm excited to see what they do. Uh, Professor Gilbert um, is going to be teaching two courses that um, are based around design build ideas uh, and it's kind of like design build quarantine style. So really similar to what she's been doing at her own home studio, the, our, the students will be working with food, hopefully growing food, um, some kind of social engagement. Uh, in one course and in the other course, they'll be taking walks, getting lost, making things from the environments they explore uh, and discover or have it right around them. And both of those courses, she wanted to emphasize that they were really rooted in social engagement and kind of discovering and nurturing communities of care in their local um, areas. So that's some of what we have in store and I think it's really exciting and I hope uh, you will join us this coming semester. Thank you so much, Tim. Our next speaker is Sarah Budishek. Hi, thank you. So I am a biology professor at Keck Science and I wanna tell you a bit about what me and the other scientists are doing to get ready for the semester. We're really excited. Um, so some of the classes are going to be able to do more real actual science um, through this virtual learning. Uh, for example, environmental chemistry is working on a collaborative project with students in at a university in Hong Kong to um, look at water quality, air quality, uh, weather and how it affects um, some environmental planning that they're doing there and working with citizen science to develop ways to present their findings to public and government officials. So really hands-on science and env applied environmental chemistry. Other classes like climate change, courses on climate change are going to bring in guest speakers live throughout the semester to talk about the cutting edge of what they're doing. Uh, some classes are working on research that's actually going to be published, hopefully, by the end of the semester. Um, for example, chemists are 
uh, bringing in collaborators to give tours of uh, high-tech chemical facilities. And um, I, for example, I'm bringing in a guest lecturer in my class who has written the paper that my class reads every year, but now we get to talk to the actual scientist behind that. Um, also bringing in a speaker who's another professor here on campus who developed the disease model for predicting um, spread on campus. I should mention I teach disease ecology and evolution, so um, it's a, a really practical semester for that. Um, a lot of our courses are actually going to have at-home science kits that get mailed to students who are in those classes. Um, for example, the chemistry kits will include ways for students to test dyes and determine sugar content of different beverages and the hardness of their local water supply and things like that. The physics one I think is especially cool. Um, they're going to be mailing all the components for students to build a catapult and um, sensors so that they can do these physics experiments at home. And a lot of our classes are just going to be tackling really important questions that we think will be engaging to students like how are human lung cells affected by pollutants and how is dairy metabolized. Um, one class is going to be entirely student driven. Uh, conservation ecology will ask students to think about the conservation ecology questions they're interested in and then build the class from there. Um, and my class, for example, is going to be doing a lot thinking about the current pandemic and about how to translate the science behind that and work with um, Pitzer's Center for Community Engagement to help um, share some of the things that they've learned in this class that might be helpful to people who have questions about um, how, what are these models predicting? How do they do that? Where did this disease come from? Um, so those are just some of the exciting things that all the different scientists are working on. Thank you, that's amazing. Tara Kranick. Hi, um, my name is Tara Kranick and I teach photography in the art field group. And I normally teach uh, analog photography, darkroom photography, um, but I have been preparing a brand new course um, that I had planned to teach this semester and I'm going to teach it. Uh, very similarly to the way that I would have taught it in person. And it's called eco-photography. And, um, you know, one of the things I love about teaching at Pitzer is the opportunity to research with your students, to collaborate with students, and pose a question that you might not know the answer to. So um, I was really thinking about the darkroom itself and, um, and also digital photography. Uh, my field is just not very sustainable. You know, we have to replace our cameras every three to five years. Our software has to be replaced every year, one to two years. Our cameras, our digital cameras are no longer usable after three years. This creates a lot of waste. Um, the darkroom isn't any better. You know, it's, I think it's actually a little bit better than digital, but what I was thinking is my students care so much about sustainability um, and yet they love the darkroom. I love teaching in the darkroom. One thing about teaching in the darkroom is that we, it's, it's a communal space. Um, we research together through trial and error. We work with materials. Um, and the darkroom is such a magical place. I mean, that's what Pitzer students love about the darkroom is that it is, it is magic. I mean, you watch an image just appear before you. It's, it's silvery. It's ghostly. It's, it's alchemic. You know, there's something really magical about working with students for the first time in the darkroom, and they absolutely love it. My courses are always, um, you know, there's always 50 perms for, you know, 10 spots. Um, and uh, so the students get a lot of individual attention. And one of the things I was thinking about is with this new course that I have been planning for two years is um, the question of is, is a no waste photography possible? Is, is a photography um, without any cameras, computers, printers, inks, cell phones, chemicals, like how do we um, create a photography that's more sustainable? So I wanted to pose this question to my students. Um, and in this course, what we're going to be doing is exploring the limits of photographic materiality. We're gonna be working with natural plant-based emulsions and everyone will be in different places. So it'll be an opportunity to sort of test out different kinds of um, local species and think about like 
how we can work with what's available to us. Um, we're going to be thinking a lot about sun exposure and time. Um, you know, making contact prints, using recycled materials, using food waste, using fermentation and solar dye processes. Um, and this is a slower kind of art. It's a really slow art where you ha really have to consider, like, what is the nature of time? Um, what does it mean to wait for something? Um, what does it mean when you put in all this labor into a piece of art and then it disappears? Many of these processes are linked to early, early history of photography, um, a process called anthotypes. And those, those were unfixable, unfixable images, fugitive images is what they were called. Um, and so it is kind of related to this, this like early kind of ghostly history of photography, that kind of magic um, that I think can be recreated with these processes, just like they are in the darkroom. Um, and I, I also am kind of pairing this with thinking about this moment, like I think really what my students need right now is to think about what does it mean to make art right now? What does it mean to make art in this moment? Um, and how do we center joy? How do we center creative play? And that's what the students love about the darkroom is creative play, um, working with materials, trial and error, failure, experimentation. Um, so these are all things that are totally possible with these kinds of other processes. Um, I also am pairing this with a series of um, I'm inviting indigenous artists to run workshops in the class to talk about um, uh, our relationship to our local environment and, um, and also thinking about histories outside the human and thinking about ecological possibility. So we're gonna be reading from um, this collection called Racial Ecologies. Um, we're also going to be reading some science fiction um, and we're gonna be thinking about um, ancestral lands and some artists are gonna talk about their work in relationship to that idea. Um, and I'm gonna be doing a podcast with these artists who will then um, uh, devise creative prompts for the whole class and then they'll come and visit virtually um, to, to do critiques with students and think about um, how the students have each worked with this creative prompt. So the course is really going to be co-creative, generative making, um, we're going to center play and experimentation, there'll be um, an open syllabi. So I'm gonna write the syllabi with the students. And what that means is that the students decide how they want to be evaluated, what they want the grading policy to be, how they wanna run critiques. Um, I'm very, uh, I don't wanna teach in this like hierarchical mode. I like to work with students to really um, think about the individual needs of each students, where they're coming from and how best um, to collaborate with them and how they want to be evaluated. Um, the course uh, is also, um, you know, another thing I was thinking about is embodiment. A lot of like what is great about being in the darkroom is, you know, I miss so much the bodies being in a studio with other people and working with materials. I'm like, how can I recreate that? And I have a background in um, somatic writing and poetry. So we're going to be bringing some of my experiences with, um, you know, training in somatic writing and, and um, bodily writing um, into the course. So there'll be a little bit of that. Um, and I'm just, I have been preparing for this course for two years. So I'm really excited my whole practice my I'm, I'm, you're in my studio now has changed because of this research that i've been doing to prepare to teach this um this is a shirt i made using the processes that i'm going to be teaching um so this is shibori using um, food waste avocado dye that i collected for a month and then um, let sit in the sun for uh like 48 hours and then i did um an anthotype process over it with um, dried rose petals. So these are some of the things that I'm going to be teaching my students. It's like how to use recycled materials, how to work with what you have, um, and to really think about like materials in innovative ways. And it's still going to be photography. It's still going to be the same course that I wanted to teach. Um, and hopefully, I'm I'm hoping to have that like real one-on-one -on -one connection with students, mentorship, and collaboration. Thank you so much. I will introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Ruti Talmor, as I said, and um, I'll be talking about the class, the two classes that I'm specifically teaching, but through those, it's actually possible to talk about production generally in media studies. We've been thinking 
a lot and working a lot to figure out how to continue to teach production courses to our students in these conditions. And because I'm teaching intro to video and senior seminar, which are basically the first video production course a student would take at the colleges and then the last, the capstone that they would take, I think you can imagine that the solutions we've come up for those two classes would be um, relevant to all the ones in between. So one of the things that we had to think about a lot was how to equip our students. And so we spent several months planning and purchasing equipment that we will be sending as kits to students from our intro classes all the way through to capstone. And for intro classes like intro to video, this is going to be a kit that basically turns your cell phone into a camera, which a lot of people have already been doing within the industry. I mean, there have been entire films that are shot on phones. And so we're going to be teaching our students using that technology. They'll each receive a kit at their house. They'll also be outfitted with the necessary software. The same will go all the way through to Capstone where students do really targeted projects. And so after one-on-one -on -one meetings between a student and the production center staff will outfit students as they need. In terms of teaching technology, we have tutorials set up and we're going to do a combination of synchronous and asynchronous to basically um, teach students everything that's synchronous will also be recorded for students who are in different time zones because we're really cognizant of that fact. There'll be a lot of work that we're doing in the synchronous components of our classes to really create the kind of community that production classes always produce, kind of how Tara was describing now. We're really thinking very carefully about ways to do that, and that's going to be small group work, one-on-one -on -one work between faculty and students, but then also like discussions, critiques, etc. We've already taught an, a fully online version of Intro to Video this summer, and it went really well, and actually the work that students made in that class will be up on our website by next week, so anyone who's interested can see that, um, just to kind of see the cool stuff that people are doing. For me personally, for Intro to Video, I've really gotten excited about thinking about how to tailor the assignments to this current moment. And so I'm thinking of teaching or having several different assignments that are very open-ended in terms of what students end up making, but one of them is going to be taking inspiration from the earliest forms of video art where people were, artists were basically my body, the space of my studio, the camera, that's it which is very generative of this moment where we've all been my body, the space of this room and this camera. So that'll be an assignment. There'll be a project on iconoclasm because of, you know, all the really interesting conversations recently about taking down monuments or recontextualizing monuments, but also cancel culture. So I'm really interested in having my students think about what it means to preserve, to transform, to remove or to reinsert things into historical narratives. And then we're gonna have an assignment that's about video and activism because so much of what we've seen, so much of the incredible work that we have all been aware of in terms of activism has come to us through video as we've all been in quarantine. And so we'll have our students kind of think through that in a variety of ways. We always, in Intro to Video, have a Cinematech series where we bring in artists, and we're actually really excited about what the digital allows us to do because it will allow us to bring in people from farther away. We're also really thinking about um, organizing that speaker series around particular issues, so Black Lives Matter and how to produce media in the context of Black Lives Matter activism will be an issue issues around the border, specifically California, issues around indigeneity and land. And we're um, hitting up a lot of alums of our program who ended up becoming really amazing media makers themselves to be part of this series because we thought that would be a really lovely way to create community and to kind of re-embody Pitzer in this particular moment and a lot of them are working on these issues in really really interesting ways so and also very much in ways that are in line with our program which is very much about 
you know, small scale production, DIY, like low budget. You don't need to have like a huge studio backing you to make amazing work. Finally, I would just say that we really all feel that this is an incredibly important moment to continue to make media and to continue to critically consume media and to continue to critically insert media representations into the public sphere. And so all of us are really excited about having these conversations with our students and working with our students to be part of that. I think we'll open it up to Q&A now and Susan Phillips and I will be co-moderating. So if you could just put your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A, that will be great. And then we'll just address them to the relevant people. Yeah, it'll be um, easier, I think, for us if you put them into the, Q the Q&A, um, if you can find it. Um, I, what I love about this whole topic, you know, <laughs> we're not talking about replicating here. That's the thing that's important, I think, to understand. We're not talking about replicating an exact semester experience at Pitzer College in a normal semester, like that would be impossible. But in the process of, of coming to these solutions, we're just stretching the boundaries of what is possible in terms of, of pedagogy. And just if I just had to say two words to convince students that fall semester will be one of the most unique semesters ever. I will just say avocado die. Like, there's just like, what else can you say? Like, how else can you can, how else can you convince someone like, come and live this experiment with us? You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be an incredible time, you know, with all these people just like stretching their minds and, and going back into history and like, bridging out with our connections. I mean, all of this stuff is taking place. I, to me, it's not to be missed. I wish that I could take every single one of the courses that has been described here today. Anyway, I just, I feel like I'm bubbling over with, you know, really every time I've been in a lot of sessions this summer, it, these panels, every time I experience, you know, something like this, it, it, it feeds my soul in some way because we're all so stuck, you know, I'm here with my kids, we're constantly doing dishes, we're making lunch, you know, get clean your room, like all this stuff is, is just the, the sort of like in the home experience. But when I come to this panel tonight, when I come to the panels this week, it has just taken me out of that into a realm of like intellectual discovery and excitement. And I personally need that right now. So let me get to some of these questions. Um, there's a couple of questions about how labs will look next semester. Uh, a question that just came open. This is mostly of course in Sarah's neck of the woods. What is intro to biology look like and what are the intro uh, biology labs going to look like? You are a biology professor, uh, but can you uh, address that, Sarah, a little bit? You're muted. <laughs> um, sorry, my Q&A has got on top of my mute button. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about labs in general and then about the intro bio labs. So science is really a way of thinking and figuring out questions. And a lot of that we can do anywhere. Um, in fact, most science these days is done on computers. You ask scientists and they spend much more of their day at their desk um, than in the lab. So we can work on skills like searching the literature to find the most relevant articles, what's been done before, and brainstorm about what we should be doing next, uh, coming up with hypotheses. These are skills we can develop in labs online. Also thinking about how do we design experiments to test these questions that we've now researched. We can do all this online very easily. Um, the step that is a bit harder is the data collection step. So I already mentioned that uh, faculty, will, uh, some classes will involve sending kits to students. Some will involve citizen scientists where uh, people in the public go out and collect data. Um, for example, that class in Thailand, they use um, people who live in that area are gonna be looking at traffic patterns and using that to think about um, how it relates to air pollution. Um, a lot of scientists, or a lot of faculty are using existing data. Uh, for example, my class 
we'll be analyzing some data that I've spent the last three years collecting. And there's so many un unanswered questions in this giant data set uh, that they'll be working on. Um, some labs will use virtual lab software. Um, and another really cool idea is some professors will actually be able to go into the lab and first students will design these experiments and then the professors or um, student TAs will go into the lab and actually perform the experiments for the students and then give them the data back. Um, a lot of the classes will be focused on data analysis and the software we do to that. Um, my class will be looking at how do we model infectious disease dynamics. Um, all this is already done on a computer. Um, classes about bioinformatics, which is a fancy word for all the, how do you process genetic sequencing data? That's um, a computational skill that's easy to do online. Um, a lot of classes will be thinking about how do we visualize data and show it in a way that is actually um, effective communication to other scientists and to the broader community. Um, there's one class that will be using um, augmented reality. So there's these tools you can use to look at your cell phone and see a molecule in three dimension and rotate it and manipulate it to really understand organic chemistry. And a lot of science is about communication um, to scientific audiences, but also our classes focus on engaging with policy and policymakers and engaging with communities. Um, so the one step is a bit harder because we're online, but we've brainstormed a lot of cool ways to get around that. And all the rest are really important skills that are going to be easy to do online. Oh, and for intro bio, I, um, I pasted all the information that I've been sent from the intro bio lab instructors into the Q and A. Um, but uh, you'll see that the, what these intro classes were really focused on um, accommodating students who are in different time zones, who have different time needs, um, because they do serve a lot of people. So we have labs at different times, ways to do labs asynchronously, um, and still build on the teamwork that's really important for science. Um, so those are just some of the highlights. Um, that's great. Um, um, okay, so Ruti, I know we said we were going to tag team. Do you want, do you have any questions that you see that you want to answer or should I just continue trudging through? You should continue because I think you've been keeping track of them. Yes, uh, probably badly, but I am trying to keep track. Um, we have a question uh, about uh, thesis support for studio art. I see Tim actually has addressed this. Do you want to talk about that quickly, Tim? What will thesis support look like uh, for studio art? Will seniors be able to receive monetary funding from Pitzer to help create their thesis? So this is definitely something we're still working on. Um, the, in the past, the students haven't really received any monetary support per se, except for through Student Senate via ArtCo, which was the art um, club on campus. Well, we have a budget, but it's for, it's normally for the thesis. And in the fall is a really a seminar course that is research and writing based. So right. it, yeah, so the practice side of the thesis is always in the spring. And that budget is the spring budget, not the fall budget. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, we had a quick question, because I want to save time for there's a really substantive and important question here about structuring classes, not being on the computer so much, you know. Uh, to me, that's like a critical issue that I want to take the time to explore. Uh, there's a question about the bio classes that use the Bernard Field Station and how you'll handle that, but I think that's Bio 44 and it's in the spring. Is that right, Sarah? That's correct. Okay, uh, so, so yeah. There's more Sorry, go ahead. microbiology. Um, so there are no field station trips planned. Okay, um, here, here it is. You know, I think one of the most critical questions we're facing for the entire semester. And, um, you know, I have my own sort of answers to this and I, and I want to invite the group to weigh in on this. I'm gonna read this thing in its entirety because I think it's really valuable. Um, and it's valuable for us too as professors. We're like, we also have Zoom burnout, you know, how do you handle that? Um, in the spring, sitting on my laptop for three to four hours in back-to-back -back lectures. 
organic chemistry, microbiology, computer science was exhausting. All I did was listen. Then I found myself on my laptop for six to seven hours doing problem sets. In computer science, we had peer tutors when we were on campus, but as soon as we went home, they stopped working. Each class offered study sessions that I always attended and in lab or, or in class, our professors would read our code and look at our problems and offer feedback and assistance. None of this occurred in March, April, or May, it all stopped. Could you articulate how upper level science and math classes are gonna be different come this fall and how will these classes cover enough material, not be miserable and yet ensure that I truly learn what I need to so that I can matriculate, so that I can matriculate to the next level um, I will start out framing this in such a way to say that we don't have control over what the other five colleges are doing. We know that they are equally as passionate and engaged about trying to solve these problems as we are for their, for all of our students here at, at the five C's. If you have particular questions about like computer science, for example, you need to ask the professors that are teaching those classes and feel free to do so. They should be beginning to share work with you. Um, I, again, I have more to, that I can say about this, but we have a wonderful panel here. Um, what I would like to do is kind of expand the question outside of STEM to, to be just for all of our classes. And like, how are we thinking of structuring things to prevent the kind of fatigue you know, that this writer is talking about, because I really think this is the million dollar question. You know, it's critically important and it's important for us too, because we are also teaching, you know, three classes in some cases at Pitzer and it, it's exhausting and it can be uh, very, very tiring. We don't, I don't think that's a model that anybody wants. Um, in the spring, it was a state of emergency. We gave students a pass on their classes. Um, but we're not giving ourselves a pass as professors now. Like we need to do better than what your semester sounds like. Um, invitation to speak that is open for anyone on this panel. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to say thank you for your uh, feedback. And this is something that me and my colleagues have been working really hard to try to do better at this semester. Um, we, uh, many faculty are switching to flip classrooms where you'll have a short video lecture that you can watch on your own time so it doesn't have to be in a row. And most of the class time will be active problem solving. These things where you had peer tutors and work together to answer questions. That's now what we're going to try to be doing in class is actually working with this material, answering questions, figuring stuff out together and not use that time for lecturing at students. Uh, you will see so much less of that. I can't promise nobody will ever see a lecture, but uh, we're trying to get away from that model. A lot of classes are dividing up students so that maybe one of, if you have a class that meets three times a week, one day half the students would come and the other would be doing an asynchronous activity. You flip that for the next day of the week and the third day of the week, everyone meets together to go over problem sets. Chemistry in particular has moved all of their intro labs to Monday and Tuesdays. This is something we can't do in person because of physical constraints, but now all those labs are on Monday, Tuesday, so that by Wednesday, everyone's been through the lab and you can, uh, the lecture can match up and work on the, these things that students have started in lab and know that everybody's already had lab. And same thing by Friday, everyone knows they've already had lab and time to go to problem solving sessions. Um, so you can make, uh, we can base our pedagogy knowing that all the students have already had lab at the same time. Um, so that's been something else that's been really helpful. Um, we also have been better organizing our peer tutoring and working with the software system and the colleges to get peer tutors organized. So that will be much better, much more like it was at the beginning of the semester in person than it was um, after we had to switch so quickly. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for that detailed explanation, Juanita. Yeah, I guess I will emphasize the fact that the spring was really emergency, right? Like we went on emergency mode. We had one week to like make any adjustments we could make. And then we tried our best, right? With very mixed results. And I think your experience, the experience you described, we can all like, you know, I think I, I feel you, right? But um, I think this summer, this is, and I just reading in the chat that we're conveying our enthusiasm. I think I, I'm glad we are. This summer, this is 
all that we're doing. Um, a lot of us have put our research agenda on hold and we're really just throwing ourselves into this and this is all we're doing this summer. So another thing that I think will be important, at least in my, in my field, something that we were doing before but that we will do more now is that we're going to be a lot more intentional in the way we build community in the classroom. So all the peer activities that we're going to have, like all the check-ins at different opportunities and different formats for interaction, we're going to be very intentional about those to make sure that we successfully create a sense of community and then we can avoid like tedious and kind of like just uh, tiring online experiences. Because I mean, we're all familiar with what those are. So we're trying our best to like avoid those. And also another thing that Tara said that also it's also like true for our courses is that we at Pitzer, a lot of us work in like a co-creating mode with our students. So I am excited to come up with ways in which this is going to work and to do that as we, as the semester progresses along with students. So a lot of the programs at Pitzer have actually become what they are after the faculty student collaborations. So for instance, uh, that beautiful community garden in, Ontar in Ontario is like the product of one of those courses in which our students in uh, collaborate with the community. So another important reason and another inspiring reason for like being at Pizza right now is what are we going to make out of all of these and what kinds of partnerships, what, have, what kinds of initiatives, what kinds of like n beautiful new things can grow from these like really unusual circumstances. Routine. I would just add that in media studies, like in science, we've decided to basically flip all tech instruction. And so all of that will be done in pre-recorded, very short video tutorials that students can like take in in their own time at the right time of day or the right time of the week. And then all class time or live time is going to be spent interacting. So what I learned from teaching a small seminar class in the spring, which actually moved really seamlessly into being online despite the emergency conditions, was that because that was a small class and because it was really like discussion driven, it worked and that was, and it was beautiful. Like we all actually saw one of my students from that class at the last session I was at and she was like, I miss our class. And I was thinking that, I did too, because it just became a really wonderful space to go to in this moment. And I think that that is something that all of us are thinking about. I know that that's something that I'm thinking about both for my students, but also selfishly for myself. Like I want that sense of community. I want what I get from being with students more than ever this semester. And so I'm not going to be wasting my time in front of the screen doing things that are like fatiguing and that could be done concisely in a different way. I want the time that we have together to be about being together, about talking, about hearing each other talk, about seeing each other's faces. So all of us are thinking about, as Sarah was saying, like dividing classes into smaller sections for parts of the week so that it's not like 20 people on your Zoom screen, but more of like seven, eight, three, depending on what the class is like. But I think it's something that everybody is really thinking about, like how can we minimize the amount of time spent on the computer and maximize the time that we are spending together on the computer. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on this issue? It has something to do also with another question that's pending that I want to get to before we end. Ter Tara? Yeah, I will just really briefly. I was actually on sabbatical in the spring, but I was a student, I was auditing several classes um, and I took uh, fully online courses um, in, over the summer. And I have to say that I experienced as a student what the student is talking about, this idea of uh, Zoom fatigue. And I found even a two hour course just exhausted. I could not pay attention. Yeah. I had a headache after these courses and, and it really made me think about like, what is my body telling me? Mm -hmm. How can we engage the body uh, like I do in the darkroom, like I do in my courses with materials? Um, and I've, I've put so much, so much effort into this question of embodiment and materiality. 
um, and active engagement. I think um, what Sarah was saying about um, the flipped classroom, that is always how my classrooms are designed. You know, I, you could look on YouTube and see me in the dark room. There's a whole bunch of tutorials, <laughs> darkroom tutorials online. Um, and I'm going to use my Instagram account. Um, and in fact, the students can go there um, at Tara Kranich underscore studio. And most of what I've been researching over the last six months is there. And um, I think it's a fun way to, um, to do tutorials and the stories and the highlights. Um, so there'll be ways for students to, um, you know, multiple kinds of tutorials through audio, through podcasting, through reading, and through visual material. So, and, and that will all be, you know, asynchronous material that's available so that, yeah, I mean, people are on in different time zones. Maybe it's not the right time to like, you know, read about the pH levels of cabbage, you know, <laughs> like, like, so I think that, um, you know, what, what people are saying about the flipped classroom experience. And also I want to emphasize that my, my courses are very small. There's like 10 students. So I'm always meeting individually with students throughout the semester. And I still want to maintain that. I want to interview students, um, you know, the first week I always spend, you know, 20 minute meetings with the students just to get to know what are their access levels? Um, what do they have? Um, you know, what kinds of, uh, how can I help them, um, you know, make the best of this experience? You know, what can I do? Um, and so there's, there's going to be a lot of individual meetings, individual critiques, individual feedbacks, feedback, um, which I think is like something that is not possible um, in some of these other institutions that I hear my colleagues talking about where all of their material is asynchronous it's like no we're gonna have or i'm gonna try my best to have this this collaborative experience and this experience with materials and i think that's so important um we're almost at the end of our time and and i i've just found this to be so inspiring i wanted to connect a little bit of it again we can't we don't have any control over what the other colleges are doing um, we're in conversation with, you know, Keck scientists because they're assigned to us like Sarah and we're so happy to be in collaboration with you, Sarah. Um, the, in, I wanted to say about this question of the, the e like the, um, sorry, the, like the tutors stopping working. This is a big conversation happening right now at Pitzer. So we've, we're figuring out how to do tutoring and, and more like having a, Tutor, more like a tutorial approach so that it's peer, there can be a lot of peer engagement. People who actually are being hired, you know, for jobs to do tutoring and to have small group peer engagement that's beyond the classroom. This is the model they're using in econ, for example. And all of this leads to the last question that I, that I wanted to get. At. Oops, there's another question that came in while I was talking. There's another uh, one which I, I can speak to this one. Okay, recorded lecture. Yeah. yeah, some some of this stuff is is the stuff that I wanted to talk about too, Ruti. But please, uh, why don't you go ahead? Because I've been talking all week. Well, I was just going to say that um, we're definitely looking at subtitling because we're aware of the access and equity questions, and so that's something that the college is working on with particular technologies. And then, as far as the length of lectures, that's something else that's been a big conversation among faculty with some faculty who were kind of still committed to like the lecturing that they usually do. Everyone's basically come around to the point that, as you're saying, like a 50 minute video lecture is not 50 minutes of your time. It's a lot more of your time and it's really challenging. And so I think in the majority of our flipped classrooms, we're thinking about these like micro lectures that are very topically focused. I know some faculty that I've talked to have thought, I mean, this isn't relevant for me this particular semester, but they're going to basically do a micro lecture and then have a discussion question that follows it to ensure that, as you're saying, you've understood the basic concept before moving onward. So people are really thinking about how to separate out information so that it's not Again, like it doesn't matter. It's even harder, I think, to look at a video of somebody talking to you for 50 minutes than it is to look at the actual person talking to you for 50 minutes. So all of these things, as Juanita was saying, are things that people didn't have time to kind of think through in the spring, but we've been spending the summer basically thinking about them. Yeah. But thank you. That's a, those are two really good questions. They're excellent questions. And I think they're questions everyone is asking. Mm -hmm. I do have to say, I've been looking at you for 50 
eight minutes or more and it's a pleasure so i'm really happy the 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 last question that we addressed had has a key a key phrase in it learning is an interactive process that is what we prize at pitzer this is why we have small classes we give feedback on grading we're not like a scantron school we give feedback on process like we want to be with you and interact in this you know we will we will work with you and and accessibility and flexibility are key parts of that not all classes are going to um be the same um but everyone is is just doing their level best to try to make this semester happen in like such a unique way and i for one am just really excited to see the results um i do think that when you stretch in the way that we're stretching when you stretch beyond the boundaries of conventional teaching it's asking us questions we've never been asked before as an entire society and we're trying to find the answers you know who would we rather do that with than our Pitzer students. That's what we want to do. We want to be with you so that we can have this adventure together. To me, fall semester is going to be one of the most connective semesters that we have ever experienced. And I hope we can have a panel at the end of fall semester and say, did it work? Did you feel connected? Did you feel excited? Did you get goosebumps listening to people like I did here today? You know, did you feel emotion? And, and did you feel part of a community? Because ultimately that's what I think the goal is of the whole thing. Anyway, um, Ruti, thank you for um, moderating today's panel. Juanita, Sarah, Tim, and Tara. And thank you so much to our audience. Um, this was the final session that we know of um, <laughs> this week out of three, and it was a wonderful one. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Susan, for organizing all of it. Thank you, and thank you for everyone for coming. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good Bye. to see you all.